Hello, and welcome to this video tutorial. Again, my name is Melissa Huang. Hopefully you already know that, though, because I hope you've already seen a few different videos on this channel. Uh, first and foremost, research, because I am going to reference that one quite a bit. Um, but uh, welcome to this video on historical research. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is um, locations, right? Historical locations. So what can you do when you can't visit a location either because of current events or because it doesn't really exist anymore or because uh, it doesn't exist in a way that has a great analog to the past, right? Well, you can thank the internet for reconstructions. <laughs> so um, the internet is filled with many experts and many nerds uh, and there's a pretty big cross-section there between those two groups um, who enjoy really niche things, right? <laughs> so um, mainstream cultural sites, especially the Greek and Roman ones, will often have uh, online reconstructive sketches or even a virtual reality of um, your location. So uh, when you're searching for historical locations, the best thing to do is include the time period you're interested in and the general area. Um, for very popular locations like ancient Rome, you can include things like virtual tour, reconstruction images, whatever. Okay. So one big caveat, which is going to lead me into an even bigger one, <laughs> is going to be asking when your source was created, right? So here I've got this beautiful 18th century sketch of uh, the Trojan War. Um, but you'll notice that uh, when you're looking at items that are created even a few hundred years after something um, took place, uh, basically the embellishments and artistic flair are much more representative of the values of the time um, during which it was created than of the time it was depicting, right? Um, so in addition, in a lot of circumstances, we have better uh, understandings of what was going on architecturally uh, because of the archaeological digs that we've managed to um, conduct and the standards to which we conduct them now versus when they were originally discovered by uh, the British, essentially, right? Um, this is obviously painting a very broad picture, but um, it is important to have some context, right? Uh, first-hand accounts are going to be the best, but you have to consider the source. I've said it before, I will say it again, consider the source, right? Um, today we have the technology to image scrolls that are too delicate to even touch, right? We can cross-check ancient references from all over the world and not just the ones that happen to be found closest, right? And remember the Roman Empire spanned several <laughs> different countries and uh, the kinds of things that they wrote down um, and thought worth keeping uh, survived in many different locations, right? So, um, but consider who is doing that writing uh, at the time, right? Who's educated enough to write down anything, right? Who can afford the expense of um, writing tools and implements, right? Who's wealthy enough to make sure those works endured? Um, what kinds of writing were judged artistically or historically valuable enough to retain and be preserved uh, by the act of having 20 monks sit there and copy it letter by letter into record, right? The reason why we have so many oddities in text is because many of those monks couldn't read and uh, definitely couldn't read Latin or Greek and were just like literally copying the shapes that they could make out um, and doing their best essentially <laughs> with what they had. Um, so. One key example of this, which is going to give a lot of historical context, is the Iliad and the events of the Trojan War. So uh, the Trojan War has archaeological evidence dating to the 12th century-ish, 13th, 12th century, um, and uh, the events of the Iliad are composed as if they were contemporaneous to those, and there have been significant analogs between text um, that we have today, uh, you know, the versions of the Iliad um, and uh, archaeological evidence of what happened in the 13th century. So we know for a fact that it must have been composed, if not contemporaneously, then very close to the actual events of the Trojan War, right? But our first textual evidence 
uh, first little bits and scraps and pieces of papyri of the Iliad come from the 8th century. So that is a significant time to cross uh, and to maintain the integrity of the story, right? Enough so that we can literally point out archaeological correlations between what the text is saying and what the archaeological evidence is saying, right? And so, of course, the answer to this puzzle is the oral tradition, right? So there were bards who memorized swaths of poetry and recited them for food and shelter, right? There's a theory that historically humans, when we had to, we have had a huge capacity for perfect verbal recall. Um, before writing, you had to remember everything, right? <laughs> if you didn't remember what thing a person said to you, it was lost forever, right? So if you consider the oral tradition that preceded writing, long preceded writing, um, consider again, you know, how many stories do we have from this time period? How many stories do we not have, right? It must be, you know, 90% of knowledge from that time period has gone, right? That we just didn't keep, you know? So when you're considering the written record, um, which is what we have from ancient times, you can consider, okay, well, who decided that wartime epic poetry was, you know, more valuable than sexy ballads, some of which they still kept, of course, you know. Um, like This is a very important caveat to have in mind when you're considering historical research, right? So uh, it's even more important anytime you look at history to ask, you know, who wrote these stories and who decided that these stories were worth keeping, right? What stories might they not have thought worth keeping, right? Um, I think this is sort of the uh, little slender alleyway where historical fiction is born, right? There are so, so many um, different ways that things could have gone that we just don't have a record of anymore, right? Then uh, when you start to consider, you know, even beyond ancient times, okay, well, who in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, was out there traveling and picking up uh, archaeological evidence, maybe scrubbing it clean of paint and then taking it home with them, right? Who are the people keeping journals and travel logs and so on? And uh, what might their perspectives be about the locations they're visiting? Um, this goes back to the general research video and about uh, the kind of, you know, biases and preconceived notions that we have based on our own upbringing, right? Every single person has a different context for the way they view the world, right? Um, being a writer, <laughs> you get to share a little bit about your perspective with other people, which I think is great. So uh, with that framework in mind, you can sort of be critical, right, of the histories that you're reading. Uh, the closer you look at things, <laughs> any history historical uh, <laughs> entry, essentially, um, you start to see more cracks, right? Um, especially when you're looking at summaries, encyclopedias, and, you know, stories and nice, neat narratives, right? Um, Helen of Troy herself is maybe one of the most famous examples of this, right? So in some depictions, she is stolen away by Paris, and others, uh, Aphrodite makes her sort of seduces her and um, forces her to go away with Paris. And some, she hates Menelaus and she's just waiting for an excuse to run. <laughs> but in some other versions still, she wasn't even actually kidnapped. Uh, Hera made a phantom Helen, a breathing image made of air to give to Paris and he was duped, right? <laughs> so like there is no consensus really. There's There are many, many narratives. Um, this takes me back to uh, when my Greek professor and mentor watched uh, Percy Jackson, you know, the movies, and uh, was walked out really pissed in the theater. She was just really upset by, you know, the travesty of what they had done to uh, Greek mythology and history. Um, but after a few hours, she went back and thought, okay, well, you know, technically, with living stories like this, every single retelling is valid, right? There is no right one single narrative that is correct. There's only the most popular ones, right? So she was begrudgingly forced to accept that uh, Percy Jackson is a valid retelling of the same old story. And in fact, that retelling with different, you know, 
um, features and aspects to it is a very <laughs> Greek uh, tradition, right? So um, that is one one nice example, modern example of uh, intertextuality, I guess. So I do have to apologize for the Greek and Roman centric lecture here, but um, these are pretty much the only occasions I have to uh, break out my degrees um, at parties. People just walk away from me, so. All right, let's look at some historical sites then. Let's look at our sources. Um, so from the library homepage, library.western.edu, uh, because our library is based in Colorado and uh, as discussed a little bit in world building, we do have um, a lot of government documents and uh, that kind of thing. We also are connected to the uh, digital public library in a pretty significant way. So uh, if we go from our homepage here and click on this little digital archive tab, we can look for something like Pioneer. See, not ancient Greek or Roman. Uh, and here we've got uh, a few different entries for um, different things like local events, Pioneer's Day, um, museums, and people. So if you were to click on a person uh, and in some cases on locations and uh, events, you can open in these little tabs up to see a little bit more about them, right? There's not much here, but we do over here have a link out to the Digital Public Library of America. When there is information out here, it's usually uh, pretty good. You get to see all the images and things. Oftentimes these are all public domain documents, so you can use them freely however you like. So if you were to click on all results, you can see here the documents uh, and anywhere you know this person was mentioned right so but bear in mind right these records are you know going to be about people who probably owned land who had some kind of legal proceeding who had official documentation who went through some kind of process right this is a probate case so um, and we're talking about executors or guardians, so this is probably a contested will or something like that, right? Somebody owned things uh, and therefore people were there to argue about it or to put it into records, right? So, all right. When you're looking for uh, real people, um, genealogical societies are your friend. <laughs> People are really into genealogy, I find, um, especially when they get older, they get more interested in their own local history and uh, personal history sometimes. So uh, your best bet might be to just look for a genealogical, always misspell it, society or societies, and then your general location. So something like that. Missouri State Genealogical Association. Here we go. If the site looks like this, that is a very good sign, right? <laughs> the kind of people who have a lot of time to devote to genealogy um, don't usually care about the way their site looks. So um, you'll find here like surname lists, very good, uh, research links, families, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but keep in mind with names, um, obviously, literacy rates uh, in this country have always struggled, I would say. So uh, there will often be spelling differences. So Wilson with two L's versus one L, Smith with an I versus with a Y, things like that. So sometimes you might have to play around with the spellings to get what you are looking for. Uh, but of course, <laughs> another caveat, genealogical societies are based on families that have been around um, in this country, especially for, you know, a few generations usually, um, don't usually include native populations in that. Um, in fact, a lot of records of native populations were destroyed. So it goes, right? So um, you should always sort of be aware of uh, what you're looking for, right? Uh, another good general site for first-hand accounts um, and for uh, historical documents is going to be Hathi Trust. Dot org. So this is h a t h i trust dot org, and you can look for uh, any kind of documents you would like. So let's say Pioneer, Colorado. See what we get. I clearly didn't rehearse any of this beforehand. So, all right. 
The biggest thing you'll note is that uh, the item viewability is hugely different. Right? So the all views includes over a million, 1.3 million results, but full view includes only items that the public can see or sometimes if you go through the library, um, what your institution can see, right? Um, and that is because HathiTrust, uh, as well as some other um, big um, preservation sites, uh, I think they're working together with Google, uh, are basically digitizing documents for, especially for universities. But sometimes those universities require um, a limited access thing. So it might be available to um, the University of California um, subscribers, but not for us, right? So. Um, here you'll see uh, the most of the uh, publications are going to be government publications and you remember what we said about those, I don't have to repeat myself. But um, when you can see the full view of something, what I like about this is you can see the image uh, of the text. And sometimes people have written little notes in the margin. Um, they have annotated. Uh, it would be really interesting to see, like the family Bibles, right? That have been um, have, that have sort of served as records and record keeping for families, right? So this is nice. <laughs> you can see this must have been slightly reflective or something, um, but. Uh, some of these will be text searchable. It may not be perfect, right? But it is nice to sort of see the kinds of font they used, maybe the kinds of spelling that they used, um, words like in as much <laughs> that we may not use as frequently, you know, today. So, uh, all right. If you do see something here though, that uh, is restricted, so it'll say limited search only, um, Sometimes it'll tell you what library uh, owns it, sometimes not. Um, let's see. But if you if it is under copyright, but you really, really, really want it, uh, just email it to me and I will try and find it through a secret library backdoor. Um, there are many, many of those, usually by talking to other librarians, right? At different institutions, we can reach a broader net um, of things. So the other one is archive.org otherwise known as the Internet Archive. They also host the Wayback Machine. So Internet Archive looks pretty similar um, to Hathi Trust. You can click in and see you know, the images, the scanned images, um, so you can get any marginalia uh, there. But if you are interested in the Wayback Machine, you can see any um, archived website uh, the year that it was um, archived, right? So something like Gaia Online, take me back to my early teens. You can see all the iterations that have been saved. Um, obviously the more <laughs> recent we are, the more um, iterations we've saved. But if you go back to something like 2004, you've got three snapshots. Let's just pick one of these. The earliest time. It does a mapping of all the live pages. So you can see what it looked like in 2004 when I first joined. Uh, and it has changed a lot since then. So you can literally click on the map. And oh, critical error. Let's try forums. And see what the forums looked like. Right? So obviously it may have some trouble loading sometimes because it literally has to go fetch every single you know, thing that it took a picture of. But um, this could be useful for something. I'm not really sure what. It's not my job to tell you what to use things for. Um, but it, it is a tool that's available to you, right? And again, you know, these videos are totally general. So if you do have specific questions for me, please, please email me. Just ask me and I will do whatever I can to help you get what you need because that's my job. All right, so that should be the conclusion of these genre fiction videos. So, bye-bye.